Welcome to the second session of the afternoon. I'd like to introduce Father Jaron Mara, a priest of the Society of St. Pius X. He taught for a number of years. He taught philosophy in their seminary in Germany. Uh, he is now at a chapel in Switzerland, and he still occasionally teaches at the seminary. He's author of the book published in German called Fatima, Rome, Moscow. And his topic today is on the consecration of Russia. The necessity of the consecration of Russia. So please welcome Father Mera. <clears throat> the title of this conference is The Request, the Request of the Consecration of Russia Confirmed by Divine Signs. In 1917, God sent the Virgin Mary to us in Fatima as the remedy for great evils in the world. The evil of the sin will be followed by far more evils if we don't do penitence. The heaven knew the great crisis who would overcome the church and the world in the next hundred years as a punishment for our sins. God gave us a remedy. This remedy is the Immaculate Heart of Mary and his worship. And especially the victory of God should come through the consecration of Russia to this Immaculate Heart. God wanted in this greatest actual crisis that the Virgin Mary will be victorious. In this way, the might of God will be even clearer because the victory of God will come through a weak instrument. The consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart seems humanly to be a very weak instrument for the victory of God in these bad times. But God will triumph through it. The Pope, who had to fulfill this consecration, saw the weakness of this way and saw at the same time the great diplomatic difficulty of this act. That is why it was very difficult for him to do this act and uh, required a very supernatural thinking and virtue. If a pope doesn't see with certainty what he has to do, can he act? First, he had to deepen the investigation about the truth of the apparition and the message. God has given enough signs to know the truth about the request of the heaven. The Pope should have built a commission of theologians with the purpose of a deeper investigation about the Fatima apparition. Now I hear that the actual Pope has built such a commission, a commission but the result is uh, unknown at present. If the Pope is not sure enough that the Virgin Mary has really spoken, he has the obligation to do what is possible in order to obtain certainty in this matter. The prophetic revelation of Fatima with the request of a consecration of Russia is too important. The Pope must know the truth about it. Many additional signs have been given in the years and decades after the apparitions. We can recognize especially many signs, many such signs in the clear fruits of the consecration of some other nations, especially the consecration of Portugal to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Therefore, if a pope desires really becoming secure about the authenticity of a request of the Virgin Mary, it would be possible for him. Meanwhile, many serious writings appeared about the apparitions of Fatima and the consecration of Russia. These publications, too, would help him to see clear. 
If a pope wants to fight against the crisis of a church, he will perhaps discover that the consecration of Russia will help him in this purpose too. I shall explain this only in few words. The consecration is a medicine for ecumenicism, which showed many bad fruits because uh, the consecration of Russia through a Catholic hierarchy shows that the jurisdiction about the Baptist Orthodox is in the hands of a Pope and not of Orthodox hierarchy. It is a medicine against ecumenicism because it is not compatible with a great human diplomacy with respect to Orthodox Christians and the communist ideology. The Immaculate Conception is not accepted by Orthodox Christians and therefore the worship of the Immaculate Heart will help them through the grace to find back to Catholic Church. It is a medicine for the crisis of faith because the veneration of Virgin Mary, which is in this act to be minimalist in the church and become again maximalist or better traditional. The consecration would help the Pope to restore this authority in the church in as much as the Pope must not pray but order the bishops to do the consecration. He must order seriously this act which will be difficult to accept for many bishops. So asked the Virgin Mary. The consecration can be a remedy to for the modern rationalism in the church who doesn't consider the great importance of a supernatural in the human history. I was told was the Pope Benedict wrote in a recent uh, publication, he was too to rationalists to imagine the promised effect of a consecration of Russia. In the enormous number of sermons and writings of his predecessor, we don't never find the word supernatural. Here, <clears throat> the mother of God will give him us a supernatural grace. Consequently, the Pope is conscious of a deep a crisis and he is he will be able to recognize that the consecration is an aid given from heaven in this, in this crisis. But now we will turn our attention to some miraculous signs given by God, which will help the Pope to recognize the authenticity of a supernatural revelation and request of Virgin Mary. The first sign which we want to mention is the miraculous conversion of Portugal. But because this sign is already explained in the books of Frère Michel de la Sainte Trinité, we shall be well, very short in this point. In 1917, Portugal was very deeply in the hands of anarchists, and the government battled against the Catholic Church. On the 11th February 1941, the Portuguese bishops recognized the deep private and public conversion of a population of a country to Catholic faith after the year 1917. They wrote, who closed the eyes 25 years in the past, in the past and reopened them now would not uh, recognize Portugal because of a deep and extensive conversion who was realized through this little factor of the apparition of Our Lady. Indeed, Our Lady will save Portugal. In this radio speech of 31st October 1942, Pope Pius XII spoke about an atmosphere of miracle in Portugal who helped to avoid the otherwise inevitable shipwreck of the nation. After the consecration of Portugal, the nation was spared in the time of the Second World War, like Sister Lucia, Lucia predicted. And we will uh, press this pound a little deeper. 
Hitler ordered to work out the plans for the so-called Operation Felix, the aim of which was to conquer Gibraltar Rock, with which was in the hands of England. In this way, the position of England in Mediterranean Sea would be very much weakened and the way to the Suez Canal would be blocked for it. Under the order of Field Marshal Walter von der Reichenau, the infantry should move through Spain to the south to liberate, respectively, conquer Gibraltar. The infantry should be helped by the Air Force. Rudolf Schmidt, as general of a tank division, should protect the west side flank of the army because of the danger of landings of the English troops on the Portuguese coast. The 16th Armored Division or Tank Division should be stationed at Cáceres in Spain. This division should directly move to Lisbon and Porto to occupy Portugal and prevent a landing of English troops at the coast. The government of Portugal was prepared to be transferred to the Azores. Hitler wanted the help, or at least the toleration, of the Spanish government for this Operation Felix. But General Franco placed unrealizable conditions at, this, at his conversation with Hitler in Hendey. After some other attempts, Hitler was constrained to stop this Operation Felix. General Franco endeavored to, <clears throat> to keep Spain out of the war. He provoked the anger of Hitler, but not at the point that the German troops had invaded Spain. But the danger remained. On the 8th December 1940, the Portuguese bishops were assembled in the Cathedral of Lisbon and renewed the consecration of Portugal to, him, to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. This act was recommended by Sister Lucia, who assured them that the consecration would be followed by special graces for the country of Portugal. The Immaculate Conception, whose feast was on the 8th December, was the patroness of Portugal. Only two days after this consecration, Hitler postponed the Operation Felix for an indefinite time. In the eyes of faithful Christian, this is obviously not simply human chance. We see here the hand of the Virgin Mary who protected Portugal from the war. But Portugal was furthermore in danger. Germany planned Operation Isabella instead of Operation Felix, and it would be possible to realize this uh, on the um, post uh, the June 1941. Uh, on the 2nd December 1940, Sister Lucia wrote to Pope <coughs> Pius XII, the protection of Portugal will be the proof of her graces God had given to other nations if they had consecrated themselves to the Immaculate Heart of Mary like Portugal. And later we will see other examples. In 1970, <clears throat> President Salazar of Portugal was followed by President Marcelo Caetano. In this time, the Portuguese colonies rise up against the mother country, Portugal, which must wage a war with uh, the revolutionaries in Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea. Therefore, Portugal became more and more impoverished. 
In addition, in Europe, there was still no place for a nation with a cooperative constitution. The consequence was the foundation of a rev revolutionary movement in Portugal. In 1973, many officials joined to the Movimento das Forças Armadas, MFA. The movement led the uprising second regiment of tanks to Lisbon and organized uh, therefore the putsch against President Caetano of the 25 April 1975 and this replacement and his replacement by General Spinola. The people most enjoyed about this revolution uh, which was named Revolution of Flowers because the war with the colonies finished. But under the new government, the nation moved in the direction of communism. Alvaro Cunhal, who was one of the last Stalinists, came back from exile and entered the government as head of the communists. Many public offices in press military and government were soon occupied by communists. The results were compulsory expropriations of farmers, occupation of grid fields or areas, many strikes and the nationalization of 70% of banks and industry. In addition, there was a catastrophic budget deficit and bankruptcy of many private enterprises. The morality of Portugal was attacked too. The divorce was legalist and the country was inundated with pornography. The first pleasure about the revolution, the revolution was now followed by the fear of the Catholics that Portugal could transform in a communist nation. Therefore, a rosary crusade was built in this country of Fatima. Each member should pray once a day the rosary. A group of 10 teachers in Guimaraes founded this movement. On the 25th of March 1975, the number of one million rosaries was exceeded and in the same year a second million. Portuguese population visited now much more the sanctuary of Fatima on the weekends. The communists lost the elections of April 1975 and in consequence a situation of terrorism and danger of civil war was developed, uh, developed more and more in the country. Earnest conflicts between officials take place. Meanwhile, the Catholics were supported by bishops. The bishops renewed the consecration of Portugal to the Immaculate Heart of Mary on the 13th May 1975. We find a great sermon of that summer of a primate of Portugal with an appeal to Catholics in this dangerous situation. It cannot be by chance but in this uh, dangerous situation, the open Catholic resistance began on 13th July 1975. This date is the day at which Our Lady of Fatima has warned against the future communism. On this day, 10,000 Catholics demonstrated and protested against the confiscation of Radio Renascenza. On the same day, Catholic farmers assembled in the town of Rio Major to destroy the local headquarters of a communist party. One town after another repeated the example of Rio Major in July and August. It was an unique example of a counter-revolution. -revo no historian was able to identify the persons who planned, inspired, or led this campaign. The aims of the actions 
were almost every time buildings and not persons. 22 headquarters were destroyed in the nine days following the action of Rio Major. After 30 <clears throat> days, nearly every headquarters in North Portugal were in ruins. In the North, the army refused mostly to intervene because uh, a very great part of the population supported these actions and because of their sparing of human lives. On September 25th, the point was reached where communists attempted a putsch of a government. The communists had still great parts of the leadership of the army on their side, as well as many key positions in the government. Nevertheless, the insurrection could be knocked down, and Portugal remained a free nation. But humanly, we can't understand how this victory was possible without bloody complications. We can say that it was the consecration of Portugal which was the cause of this astonishing protection. Because this, part, uh, this uh, consecration influenced really the way of life and the devoutness of the Catholics who prayed willingly the rosary. This was expressly said by Cardinal Ribeiro on the Fatima Congress in Kevela, Germany. He, remi he reminded the Catholics that Portugal was protected protected in 1931 from a civil war which raged in Spain because of the consecration of the nation. The consecration protected likewise Portugal in the Second World War. And he adds that Portugal was prote protected a third time in 1975 from the alarming advance of communism. Also, the communists had many key positions in the government and began to inundate the whole pu public life. And the cardinal expressed in his way his thank to the Virgin Mary in the name of the whole nation. In 1964, Brazil too was saved by the Virgin Mary from the imminent danger of a communist revolution. While the presidency of Joao Goulart, the Marxists succeeded in introducing their followers in political offices in, Bra in Brazil, in the military, in the universities, and even in the schools, and consequently, they undermined the whole social order. All the key positions were in the hand of communists, or friend, friend of communists. In the first months of 1964, the communists were so certain to grasp the power in this country that the secretary of party in Moscow revealed the exact day at which the party will have the power in this very great and important country. President Goulart organized for the 13th March 1964 a communist mass rally. In his speech this day, he announced that he would take radical political measures, like the nationalization of the goods and change of the constitution. And he threatened that there will be bloody complications if the Congress do not respect the supposedly communist will of the people. These threats alarmed the people of Brazil, the church, and the military. The Archbishop of Rio de Janeiro, Barros Camara, spoke every week in the radio in order to warn the people that Goulart will bring Brazil 
under a red flag of communism. The Archbishop asked the people to pray and to do penance, like the Virgin Mary said in Fatima. Some other bishops followed the courageous example of the Archbishop. In view of a dangerous situation of the country, different Catholic organizations worked for a Christian future. 200,000 men were members of a Marian congregation who battled for God and against the red danger. But the most important part of the work had been done from a woman of Brazil. They organized a crusade of a rosary like, like Our Lady of Fatima had asked. They called for a great march on the 19th March 1964 in Sao Paulo. 600,000 women followed the appeal this day and prayed the rosary through the center of Sao Paulo. They cried, Mother of God, keep us from the destiny of the women of Cuba, Poland and Hungary, and other enslaved nations. The consequences of these prayers and uh, this confidence don't stay out. Then the president rewarded the disobedience and insurrection of the soldiers, of a part of soldiers, the Marine Army called the Brazil people to rise up against President Goulart. The movement of insurrection spread very quickly from town to town. Even the, civil, the seven civil governors of Brazil states rebelled soon against Goulart. Then parts of the army who supported still the people rose up actively against the president and they could take control of the situation. But it became not a bloody revolution. In the 2nd April 1964, Goulart must leave Brazil and fled in foreign countries. Therefore, two weeks after the day of prayer of Brazil women, the people were victorious about President Goulart and communism, and this in an unbloody way. The fact that communism could defeat without the people shedding his blood was obviously a grace of heaven, of heaven because of the enormous infiltration of the, of the politics and the military, this was not evident. President Johnson of USA expressed his admiration that Brazil defended communism, defeated uh, communism within the rule of democracy and without civil war. And he remembered the important role of Brazil who would have influenced necessarily other nations of South America if the revolution were successful. But now we can admire the victory of the Immaculate Heart. The Mother of God helped not only the Portugal and the Brazil, but likewise many other nations to save them from a communism. We will speak now about South Korea, because this example is very little known. A few days before the end of the Second World War, the Soviet Union declared war to Korea and conquered the North until the 38 degree of latitude. The South was then occupied by USA. The Korean War, about which we will speak, began some years later when North Korea, after USA had retired, attacked the South on 25 June 1950. Already three days later, they conquered the capital, Seoul. The UN Army and the U.S. Army came to help South Korea, but China helped to North Korea. After many struggles, the 38 degree of latitude became a second time the demarcation line. After one year of war, peace negotiations could begin between the enemies. But soon, the Chinese don't want to subscribe any text because many Chinese soldiers 
were prisoners of US Army. And USA doesn't want to force North Korean or Chinese soldiers to return to their communist country after the war. But 75% of Chinese soldiers don't want to go back and 50% of North Korean doesn't want. Consequently, the situation of war became immovable. War seems interminable. And history can see today the growth of a danger for South Korea with the progress of time. And now Our Lady of Fatima enters the history of this war. Nephew Stramsky, army chaplain, <clears throat> coordinate uh, sta statue of Our Lady of Fatima on 11 March 1953 from Portugal through the Blue Army. A beautiful statue came some times later to Korea. Therefore, on 28 March 1953, Chaplain Stramsky meets with all the bishops of South Korea in their conference. He explained to the bishops his plan to make a crusade through, this, through South Korea with a statue of Our Lady of Fatima. All the bishops agreed to his plan and promised to do all what is requir required for such a crusade, crusade to be successful. <coughs> On 5th April 1953, this crusade began. The bishop, bishop of Seoul himself came to the solemn ceremony of a division of navy in Pan Moignon. Then the triumphal procession of a pilgrim version of Fatima through South Korea continued. Wherever she came, the message of Fatima and the rosary was preached and well accepted. The faithful prayed very much for the conversion of Russia and for a real peace. On the pedestal of a statue was a plaque with a text, Pilgrim Virgin of the U.S. Army, Queen of the First Catholic Division of Marin. The Pilgrim Virgin traveled to all parts of the front. No battalion and no company has been forgotten. As Queen of Peace, she traveled to the whole country, across hills and valleys, from east to west. She traveled by day and by night, across high mountains and raging rivers, on bombed out ways, in jeep and a helicopter, in a bomber, or in a transport train for goods, in tramways and on foot. All army chaplains of the 8th Army and the 5th Air Force honored and worshipped the Pilgrim Virgin as the Queen. The Pilgrim Virgin was received everywhere enthusiastically in the towns and on the villages. What happened on the political level? On 30 March 1953, two days after the acceptance of the crusade of the Pilgrim Virgin through the Conference of Bishops, the Communist explains openly to the USA that they want to accept the American conditions for the negotiations of peace for the soldiers who don't want to return in their native country, which is communist. Two days after. This breakthrough happened, therefore, just two days after the bishops had decided the crusade. On uh, 27th July 1953, four months after the crusade of the pilgrims, uh, pilgrim virgin had begun, the armistice agreement was signed. Today, certain analysis shows that the communist forces augmented in the last time of war because of the improved logistic 
and therefore the South would have been in great danger if war hadn't been stopped. In addition, by means of this armistice, many soldiers from a communist country could live in a free country. In South Korea, 1,300,000 people lost his life during the war. In North Korea and China, a little more people must die. If the war would have continued, many more dead people had to be deplored. This was clearly a victory of Our Lady of Fatima, the Queen of Peace. These miraculous events are not a complete list. It will be possible to explain other event, events. In 1955, Austria was in great danger to be divided like Germany or to become a communist, become communist as a whole. After a public and national rosary crusade, Austria was delivered in a humanly unexpected way from such a destiny. In 1954, Germany was consecrated by his bishops to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. In this prayer, the bishops asked the Virgin Mary that the German soldiers who are still prisoners in Russia would come home before a year will pass. This was humanly saying very improbable. But the Virgin Mary heard the prayer and all the soldiers came home in the time of a year. But President Adenauer from Germany prayed himself to the Lady of Fatima before his uh, negotiations with Russia. On the 31st October 1942, Pius XII consecrate the world to the Immaculate, Immaculate Heart of Mary. This was not the consecration of Russia, like the Virgin Mary had requested. But this act was not without a response from heaven. An investigation shows clearly what this date was the turning point of a Second World War. After this date, the uninterrupted series of German victories ended and an ever-increasing number of defeats of the German troops begin. We will not explain these miraculous events in details. Nevertheless, these cases are a supplementary confirmation of the promise of Our Lady of Fatima. If you want to know more, you can read my German book, Fatima, Rome, Moscow. I have some copies here. <clears throat> After seeing this multitude of evident signs of the immac Immaculate Heart of Mary, everyone can be sure that the request of a consecration comes really from the Virgin Mary and is not an imagination of Sister Lucia. And when the requested consecration will be fulfilled, the heaven will operate a miracle much greater in comparison with the cited examples. The Pope is not the very head of a church because he is only the vicar a courage of Jesus Christ. Therefore, he had to follow the will of Christ, the real head of the church, and the will of Mary, inasmuch as it can be recognized. But there must be some precision about the consecration of a nation. Such a consecration will have the whole effect only if the responsible authorities in the church do not immediately forget this act, but incite the Catholics to continue to leave the requests of Our Lady of Fatima. This should be a lived consecration, like we see this for a long time in the case of Portugal and of Korea, but also in Brazil. 
I think this is important because the consecration to Mary is not a mechanical automatism, like pushing a button, but a human act. The more Catholics take at serious the requests of Mary, the greater the heavenly blessing will be. But it is not enough that the simple Catholics take seriously the words of the Virgin Mary, but the hierarchy of a church must respond too. The case of the consecration of Russia is a little different because Our Lady requests only the act of one precious day. The promise doesn't depend on the reaction of Russian people. There are other events not in explicit relation to Fatima, but which confirms another time that it was the special role of the Virgin Mary to be victorious about communism. It is not very known. In 1947, France was in greatest danger of a very soon communist revolution, a consequence of a bad economic situation worse than the situation in Germany after war. On 8th December 1947, France, uh, in France, the Immacul Immaculate Conception uh, appeared in the little French village, Il Bouchard, and asked the children and other Catholics to pray for France, which was in great danger. The same day, the imminent danger of communism disappeared because inexplicably the strike call for the, for the entire nation was withdrawn. We could speak of a miracle of a Vistula on uh, <clears throat> the 15th August 1922, the day of the Assumption of Virgin Mary when so many Catholics prayed at Częstochow. This was a much unexpected victory of Poland about Russian troops which were about Warsaw and threatened the whole of Christian Europe. <clears throat> the more <clears throat> The years passed, the more it became necessary that the Pope consecrate Russia in a requested clear and solemn way in order to better understand the danger of communism. We shall make some general philosophical and theological considerations in the last part of uh, this conference. Why? has the communism evolved? In general, we can assert, when people is no more willing to obey God, the consequence is that God will leave the people to oneself. This will soon or later be the beginning of a tyranny of the bad. Our Lord said that the children of this world were more prudent than the children of God. And the children of this world don't have scruples in choosing the methods like the children of God. The same things happened to the angels who don't want to serve God. They don't find the wanted freedom, but the most terrible tyranny under Satan. The strongest oppre oppressed the weaker angels. It is very interesting that the positive aim of the globalists today is everywhere named global peace. This is not only the case in the world, but it, it is as well the case in the modern church because this was the aim of the terrible days of Assisi in 1986 where 
Pope John Paul II meets with all religions to pray for a global peace. But does Our Lady of Fatima not say the same thing? She promised a worldwide peace. So that Our Lady promised is in some sense the same aim as the globalists today promises us. But we must know that there are two absolutely opposed ways to reach the aim of an universal peace. It is on the one side the way of the world, the purely natural way. And on the other side, it is the way only possible to God, the way of a supernatural charity. First, we will speak of a purely, purely natural way to peace and freedom. This is the way without God. Unlimited <clears throat> freedom leads less or more to anarchy or war between the individual, individuals. This is the way of modern liberalism. On the other side, equality, peace and security can only be reached by strong restrictions of freedom. This is the way of communism the way of totalitarian regulation of private life, the negation of principle of subsidiarity through Big Brother State. In other words, this opposition between the ways of freedom and the way of peace is the opposition between freedom and equality which were promised in the French Revolution. The third word of the French Revolution, fraternity, was only added later. This will say, a purely natural society will fall in the end necessar necessarily in the way of liberalism or in the way of equality, the way of total regulations by law. This is the way of socialism and communism. And the first way cannot remain stable, but conducts to the later. The first way, the way of liberalism, conducts after a certain time naturally to the second, the way of socialism and communism. The explanation is that unlimited liberty conducts finally to tyranny of the cleverest and slyest of the most powerful. The most powerful is the government with his police or alternatively the big money, like we see more and more in the West. The liberalism destroys the old structures of Christian nations. And when there remain nearly no structures, this emptiness in society calls for new structures. These will be given by socialism or communism. This opposition between freedom and peace is inevitable for a purely natural society without God. She can only be surmounted in the supernatural way of God. This opposition between freedom and peace can only adequately reconcile through a steadfast charity and through a real respect of every individual as a creator of God. Only this respect and this charity will make it possible to establish peace and, at the same time, freedom. Therefore, we can estimate the blessing of a society which comes out of Christian religion, which teaches us that God wants us to love each other. This required charity must be supernatural because a natural charity is too weak and instable for a fundament of society. The respect of the Ten Commandments of God, the justice, is necessarily included in this real charity. Only the charity of all men to God and to each other will lead to the real peace, which is promised through Our Lady of Fatima, a peace without communism. 
Charity includes freedom in the sense of St. Paul. Charity includes freedom in the sense of St. Paul. He presupposes that an act is free when he is done with, with charity and from interior motivation. An act is not free when he is done because of the exterior freedom of punishment. Now we understand that the Virgin Mary promised us really the last aim that the peoples want in vain to realize this is a worldwide peace. The purely natural social, social systems led in last consequence to an almighty government. This is still announced in the old pagan kings where the much extended power of the kings was interpreted as the divinity of the king. The divinity of the old pagan was only unlimited power. But in the Christian system of faith, God is not only almighty, almighty power, but he is even more charity than power, like says St. John. This faith is reflected in the ideal Christ, Christian government of a nation who tends not to the unlimited power destroying the individual, but can reconcile the individual good and the common good, the repressive power and the charity, and reconcile especially the pagan opposition of peace and freedom. Therefore, the only possible purely human peace will be, in last consequence, a communist peace of death, a peace of total regulation and equality without freedom. But the peace of the Virgin Mary will be the peace of life, not of death. Her children will live the freedom of a willing and loving fulfillment of the commandments of God. On the contrary, the purely human peace will be a peace through repression, through constantly fear and mistrust. Now we are able to understand the profound opposition of the two ways, the purely natural way and the supernatural way, who conducts both to an universal peace, but to a very different form of peace. Without redemption, the human society will finally become communist-like. The world, in the sense of a sacred scripture, is an unlimited desire of pleasure, money, power, and glory. The humans divide more or less clearly in two groups, the one who desires to become children of God and the others who desire, to, uh, who desire the above-mentioned things as the highest values. Because the desire of money will come one day to limits, it will be continued by desiring, desire of power, which has himself no limits and must end in terrible tyranny. It is very interesting that the biblical apoca apocalypse describe in the person of the Antichrist a power which is the combination of absolute monetary and political power. In this coming time, no Christian will, will be able to buy something. Really, we find today a new unity of the financial and the official political powers in the world. Therefore, we can understand that the danger of a communist-like repressive system is an inherent natural danger of human society when she neglects God. This danger doesn't exist only as a consequence of a special historical situation. This utopia of an unlimited state had been depicted to every time by philosophers or other writers. The first who depicted this terrible system was, was unfortunately Plato. He depicted a government who regulates, for example, the number of children and prescribes who can get married and with which person. 
the ideal government of Plato will forbid when deformed children can survive. The government should lie to unintelligent population in order to better reach his aim, said Plato. He thinks the state knows better than the individual what is good for him. Plato thinks it was best when people live totally naked. It should not be allowed that mothers nursed their children who were to be educated in common by state. This is a terrible vision of communism. This is an <clears throat> um, But here we must add that Plato depicted this ideal not with malice, but as an unrealistic and too ideal philosopher. Later, a system of total regulation was described by Thomas Hobbes, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Aldous Huxley, George Orwell, Wells, and to a certain extent, uh, philosophers of the student revolution of 1968. We can therefore understand that the danger of communist-like systems will not come to an end without a supernatural redemption. Not only must the individuals accept supernatural redemption, but the human society must be redempted too. The totalitarian system of communism we consider it, has been mitigated in Russia now, actually, at most superficially. But in Anglo-Saxon and European country, we can recognize a firm will of the governments and financial elites to work for a new world order of a totalitarian character. This includes a form of communism that not only begins an attack on the private persons through, milit uh, through limitations of private property, but attacks marriage and family, as well as natural law of God and supernatural revelation. This character is rarely in common with old communism, but now it went further and gradually attacks sovereignty of every particular nation in order to be able to construct a new world order. So we have radically two forms of very similar systems with global aims in preparation, one in the West and another in the East. Really, the official vision of the third secret published in 2000 seems to be no other thing than the description of international or worldwide revolution including civil war. Some people call this the October Revolution of the world. But this similarity of two systems doesn't mean peace, but rather conflict and danger of war. We heard about these things in other conferences, and therefore I will not deepen this question and not tell you about the new alarming tensions between NATO and Russia, respective China. Our Lady of Fatima said clearly, Russia will be the instrument of divine chastisement of the world. But this will not necessarily mean that today Russia is the center of the evil in the world. When we observe what happens in the world, it becomes every year more evident that the fruits of the mother of God can happen. Now we can imagine more easily a future persecution and a murdering of a pope and of many bishops, um, <clears throat> like the published part of the third secret describes. In the face of these dangers, the Pope will have very strong reasons to obey the request of the Virgin Mary and consecrate Russia. Mary has sufficiently shown, shown through the benedictions of the Portugal and other nations that such a, such a consecration is really her will and will be blessed with her promised inundation of graces. The great disproportion 
between the way and the result will be the best proof of a supernatural character. Mary has promised the conversion of Russia and is, this is his conversion to Catholic Church. But she suggested that the conversion of Russia will be the occasion of the conversion of many other nations in a great crisis. It seems that it will be like a domino effect. If Mary says that the world will have a period of peace, it is not possible that the Virgin Mary think only about a political peace. It seems that a great part of the world will be in peace with God in the true religion, in addition to a political peace. The same triumph was announced by St. Louis Mary Grignot from Montfort. Thank you. The Blessed Virgin gave us a message how to have world peace, that only, that only she can help us. But perhaps we don't get enough perspective. We say, well, nothing dramatic has happened. And it's because our commentators, our newspapers, our editor writers, the people that we really pay attention to, the people that speak on television in the mainstream press and so forth, people who are under the pay of the enemy often, have yet to point out to us that since we have despised Our Lady's message as a, the human family, we've despised it, there have been 1,686,570,000 violent deaths as a direct result of ignoring Our Lady of Fatima. That is, again, one billion. That is one with nine zeros after it, plus another 686 million people who have died violently for the one simple reason that we've ignored Our Lady of Fatima. We could point out, perhaps another time, that if this is not enough perspective to give us that in these 95 years of ignoring Our Lady of Fatima, we have paid a tremendous price but as bad as that is, that price will be doubled or tripled in the next couple of years if we ignore her much longer. Just a few months ago, the world's population passed seven, seven billion people. Seven billion people. <laughs> Scripture tells us, and other prophecies tell us, that one-third to two-thirds of the entire population of mankind will be wiped out in this war to come. I don't know what it takes to wake us up. Maybe we have to find it on NBC or CBS or some commentator in the New York Times before we finally take this seriously. And maybe we say to ourselves we take it seriously, but I think we don't take it seriously enough. We have many priorities. Sometimes I wonder how I get through my day between what I'm supposed to do today, between getting up and doing my reading, uh, doing my other work, talking to people that, that God wants me to talk to and so forth. And we only all have 24 hours a day. And I'm sure that my life is not as busy as the bishops and the, and the pope. But we must make this priority number one. There is nothing more serious, nothing more important, nothing more urgent than Our Lady's message at Fatima. And this is something that I don't know how to say. I remember getting a letter from an older bishop many years ago. I think he was in Ottawa. And he said to me basically in his letter, Father Gruner, if you would not raise your voice so much, if you would not yell at us, 
we might start paying attention to you. And I said, wrote back to him and I said, I appreciate very much your interest and your concern and your advice. Now, if you can tell me how I can do that any better than what I'm doing and get the attention, I'd be very happy to do it. I hate yelling at people. I hate raising my voice and I hate trying to draw attention to myself. But there's no other way around on this message. If there's something more important, and certainly yesterday we were in this March for Life here in Rome, and the number of people that are killed by abortion since about 1980, 75, by the statistics we, we looked up is about 1,300,000 people. And by war, there's another 78 million people. And then by government murder, not only in Russia and China, but other parts of the world, 238 million people. These are catastrophic, and they lead us to think that we are, as Pope Pius XII, rather Pius X, St. Pius X said, that we are in the days just before the coming of the Antichrist. These proportional, these things that are happening to us, which Pope Benedict, when he was Cardinal Ratzinger, said, that refer to this Fatima message is found in sacred scripture, that we are living the times of the apocalypse. And although we can be distracted with everything from daily newspapers to uh, new movies or whatever else it is that, that, in, that entertains us, these things are happening around us and they're happening every day. And they're happening in such a way that uh, how can we deny that we're living in, if it's not the apocalypse, if it is not the, the time coming before the Antichrist, it is the best, uh, shall we say, um, preview or uh, event which would, the world has never seen before. I have come to warn the faithful to amend their lives and ask pardon for their sins. They must not continue to offend our Lord, who is already deeply offended. Final vision on October 13, 1917. Our Lady silently held out the scapular, a gesture which indicates that she wants everyone to wear it.
Our Lady said, If my requests are not heeded, Russia will spread her errors throughout the world, raising up wars and persecutions against the Church. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer, and various nations will be annihilated. Pray, pray a great deal and make sacrifices for sinners, for many souls go to hell because they have no one to make sacrifices and pray for them. The Blessed Virgin gave us a message how to have world peace, that only, that only she can help us. 
But perhaps we don't get enough perspective. We say, well, nothing dramatic has happened. And it's because our commentators, our newspapers, our editor writers, the people that we really pay attention to, the people that speak on television in the mainstream press and so forth, people who are under the pay of the enemy often, have yet to point out to us that since we have despised Our Lady's message as a, the human family, we've despised it, there have been 1,686,570,000 violent deaths as a direct result of ignoring Our Lady of Fatima. That is, again, one billion. That is one with nine zeros after it, plus another 686 million people who have died violently for the one simple reason that we've ignored Our Lady of Fatima. We could point out, perhaps another time, that if this is not enough perspective to give us that in these 95 years of ignoring Our Lady of Fatima, we have paid a tremendous price. But as bad as that is, that price will be doubled or tripled in the next couple of years if we ignore her much longer. Just a few months ago, the world's population passed seven, seven billion people. Seven billion people. <laughs> Scripture tells us, and other prophecies tell us, that one-third to two-thirds of the entire population of mankind will be wiped out in this war to come. I don't know what it takes to wake us up. Maybe we have to find it on NBC or CBS or some commentator in the New York Times before we finally take this seriously. And maybe we say to ourselves, we take it seriously, but I think we don't take it seriously enough. We have many priorities. Sometimes I wonder how I get through my day between what I'm supposed to do today, between getting up and doing my reading, uh, doing my other work, talking to people that, that God wants me to talk to and so forth. And we only all have 24 hours a day. And I'm sure that my life is not as busy as the bishops and the, and the pope. But we must make this priority number one. There is nothing more serious, nothing more important, nothing more urgent than Our Lady's message at Fatima. And this is something that I don't know how to say. I remember getting a letter from an older bishop many years ago. I think he was in Ottawa. And he said to me basically in his letter, Father Gruner, if you would not raise your voice so much, if you would not yell at us, we might start paying attention to you. And I said, wrote back to him and I said, I appreciate very much your interest and your concern and your advice. Now, if you can tell me how I can do that any better than what I'm doing and get the attention, I'd be very happy to do it. I hate yelling at people. I hate raising my voice and I hate trying to draw attention to myself. But there's no other way around on this message. If there's something more important and certainly yesterday we were in this March for Life here in Rome, and the number of people that are killed by abortion since about 1980-75 by the statistics we, we looked up is about 1,300,000 people. And by war, there's another 78 million people. And then by government murder, not only in Russia and China, but other parts of the world, 238 million people. These are catastrophic, and they lead us to think that we are, as Pope Pius XII, rather Pius X, St. Pius X said, that we are in the days just before the coming of the Antichrist. These proportional, these things that are happening to us, which Pope Benedict, when he was Cardinal Ratzinger, said, that refer to this Fatima message is found in sacred scripture, that we are living the times of the apocalypse, and although we can be distracted with everything from daily newspapers to uh, new movies or whatever else it is that, that, in, that entertains us, these things are happening around us and they're happening every day. And they're happening in such a way that 
uh, how can we deny that we're living in, if it's not the apocalypse, if it is not the, the time coming before the Antichrist, it is the best, uh, shall we say, um, uh, preview or uh, event which would, the world has never seen before. Just looking at the Catholic Church, for example, the only other time in church history that comes close to this time is the Arian crisis, when 90% of the bishops were Arian. And there was only one, about three or four bishops who actually stood up, and the greatest of them all, St. Athanasius, was actually excommunicated by the Pope in 357 AD. Now, he wasn't really excommunicated because as the church has always recognized, as St. Thomas points out, that law is not something that just the legislator says. Law is the ordination of reason. It is for the common good. And as the church law to this day points out that no one can be punished if he doesn't commit a crime. So because Athanasius was standing up for the faith, because he was defending the faith, which was his duty to do, he could not be punished even if the Pope pronounced a sentence of excommunication. In fact, Liberius regretted his action, but Liberius is the first Pope not to be canonized from the time of St. Peter to the year 357. It's well for us to remember then that we need not be afraid of the judgments of men if we are on the right, on the right side of God. It's a principle that we need to keep in mind. We also have to understand that, that prophecy is a function in the church. It's a function that will never go away. It's a function that must be respected, just as the apostolic offices must be respected. As St. Paul tells us in Ephesians, the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, not just the apostles. The role of prophecy is essential. Scripture tells us that we must not extinguish the spirit. We must not despise prophecy, but we must test all things and hold fast that which is good. So that is why I've promoted the message of Fatima, not only because it's unique among all the messages, but of course it's been approved by the church. As Father Joseph St. Marie pointed out here in Rome, he's the one who wrote the speech for the Pope in 1982 when he went to Fatima. Father Joseph St. Marie points out that it is the role of the hierarchy to judge, to test whether the prophet speaks the truth. But once the hierarchy recognizes that the message comes from God, then the Pope himself and the bishops are bound to obey, not the prophet, but God who speaks through the prophet to them. That obligation is primordial. That is not for us to say, I'm telling the Pope what to do. No, but Our Lady Fatima is telling him what to do. All I do is explain what it means. I answer the objections of theologians or others who haven't had the time to think about it. So when we get back to 1917, Our Lady comes. She comes and gives a message to show mankind the way to peace. She was asked, she was insisted that she come. She comes and she explains. And then for the next 95 years, we basically ignore her. So our Lord himself in 1931 explained to the Pope and the bishops something, a lesson from history. He said, make it known to my ministers, given they follow the example of the King of France, in delaying the execution of my command, like the King of France, they will follow him into misfortune. What is that, what is that example he's talking about, the King of France? On the 17th of June, the, to the very day, the 17th of June, 1689, our Lord spoke to St. Margaret Mary and told her to tell the King of France to consecrate France to the Sacred Heart. Now the kings of France, there were three of them from that day, all ignored St. Margaret Mary's prophecy and our Lord's command through St. Margaret Mary. Even during her lifetime, St. Margaret Mary was known as a saint. She was not some, she was well hidden, but she, 
Her reputation for sanctity was well known among her contemporaries. And so for them to ignore this, they paid with their lives. On the 17th of June, 1789, that's 100 years later to the day, the King of France was stripped of his authority by the Third Estate. Three weeks later, the French Revolution, the storming of the Bastille, on the 20th or 21st of January, 1994, his head was cut off by the soldiers of the revolution. And our Lord makes reference to this and says, make it known to my ministers, given they follow the example of the King of France, in delaying the execution of my command, like him, they will follow him into misfortune. Up until now, basically, the popes and the bishops around him have ignored, have delayed, have had one excuse after another. Uh, I think I've heard them all. And as we've had proven at these conferences before, none of those excuses really hold water. There is really no excuse for not doing it. However, that is not their choice up to now. And so we have a choice here. Of course, none of us are the Pope. None of us can command the Pope. Only he has the authority to command in the church himself or others, all the rest of the church. But we have, we are not without resources. We will talk about this in another conference. But it's not just for the Pope. As the Pope himself, speaking at Fatima two years ago, said, what is foretold in the secret is the passion of the church. And yes, there's a the persecution of the Pope, but the church, the Pope is within the church. And so it's not just the Pope that suffers the passion coming up, but it is the church also.